This is Brad Carmack, the author of Homosexuality, A Straight BYU Student's Perspective. You can obtain this book for free by downloading it from bradcarmack.blogspot.com. You're also welcome to email me to purchase a hard copy at homosexualityperspective at yahoo.com. We're going to continue on building a moral case for LDS same-sex marriage. We've done 18 reasons up to now. We're now on reason 19, which is to increase freedom. Okay. Um, I'll start out with a proposal. The meaningfulness of agency, which is the power to select altern an alternative, is inversely correlated to freedom. Uh, I would say freedom is the number of alternatives you have. Agency is the power to choose from amongst those alternatives. So opening up LDS marriage to same-sex couples gives same-sex couples a very significant alternative that they didn't have previously. In a very real way, it expands their freedom. Um, and many of the same-sex marriage advocates exemplify this quote from Alma 43, which is, And now the design of the Nephites was that they might preserve their rights and privileges, yea, and also their liberty. They were fighting for their homes, their liberties, their spouses, and their children, for their rights of worship, their families, and their freedom. Um, Clay Essig wrote, In LDS Seminary Institute, I was taught that marriage, our choice of who we marry and how, is one of the most important and personal choices or exercises of our God-given agency that we can make in mortality. If marriage is an exercise of personal choice and agency for us, isn't it the same for our gay and lesbian neighbors? So the argument here is um, that it's a, a net moral good to increase freedom by allowing the option to be available for an individual to marry someone of the same sex. Um, for at least that subset of same-sex marriage advocates that they have a religious belief, that uh, same-gender marriage should be allowed, we should at least refrain from opposing them based on our, uh, our strong belief in religious freedom. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants 134 um, articulates this principle. It says, We believe that no government can exist in peace except such laws are framed and held inviolate, as well to secure to each individual, each individual the free choice and the free exercise of conscience. Human law should never suppress the freedom of the soul, and we hold sacred the freedom of conscience. We believe that governments have a right and are bound to enact laws for the protection of all citizens in the free exercise of their religious belief, but we do not believe that they have a right in justice to deprive citizens of this privilege or proscribe them in their opinions. So even if we had disagree with the dictates of their consciences, for those same-sex marriage advocates um, whose consciences so dictate that they um, religiously they want to have same-sex marriage, um, it might be wise to get out of their way or even to join them in fighting for honorable marriage over the anti-family alternatives of lifelong celibacy or promiscuity or cohabitation. Um, these are kind of what they've been relegated to by society. And it seems that marriage is a better family alternative for them than the alternatives of promiscuity, celibacy, or cohabitation. Um, we have a number of scriptures that talk about marriage being honorable in all, um, that forbidding to marry is not ordained of God, and to do unto the least of these our brethren as we've done um, unto him. And just to close this uh, arguments about increasing freedom, I'll quote from Wayne Scow, who said the following, Do we care enough about the well-being of our homosexual brothers and sisters to allow them a socially approved, supportive structure of love, acceptance, and security, like that enjoyed by married heterosexuals, and the opportunity to grow together with a loved one in sustained, committed intimacy? Jesus did say that we should judge human behaviors by their fruits, that is, by their practical outcomes, not by some ideology. Scripture teaches us by implication that it is not good for a man or woman to be alone. If two people of whatever gender commit to each other that they will love, cherish, and support each other without reservation through life's vicissitudes, will not such commitment likely bear good fruit, and should we not support that? I say yes. So that's reason number 19. Uh, reason number 20 kind of has three reasons um, embedded in it. It's to increase integrity, security, and happiness, and community. So a virtue ethics perspective, this is one of the primary ethical reasoning uh, theories. There's deontology, utilitarianism, and virtue ethics. So virtue ethics evaluates moral choices um, based on what character attributes can result from the conduct um, and how a way of living results in eudaimonia or human flourishing, the good life. And so we can look at the different alternatives available to a same-sex couple. And... Um, we can say either allow them same-sex marriage, same-sex couple, or disallow them from same-sex marriage. Which one would a virtue ethicist uh, select? Um, I'm going to argue that same-sex marriage, more than the absence of same-sex marriage, contributes to the character attributes or the inherent uh, moral goods of happiness, community, security, and integrity. Okay, so I'm saying it's ethically superior from a virtue ethics perspective. 
Now we often think of integrity, um, that's the first virtue that we will look at. How will we define integrity? Well, it oftentimes is considered as uh, one or two or three of these concepts. One, um, an idea of wholeness, an aspect of wholeness. Uh, two, um, a component of keeping commitments. And three, a component of honesty or authenticity. Okay, These are kind of all sort of um, associated with the, the word integrity. So compared with mixed orientation marriages and celibacy, same-sex marriage on average accords more of all three components of integrity to homosexual oriented people. Um, now not everybody, uh, not all the homosexuals in mixed orientation marriages feel or act duplicitously, and, um, but many of them do feel a great hole in their lives that's kind of characterized by lacking an, an authentic, intimate, romantic relationship with someone that he is or she is erotically, emotionally, and romantically attracted to. Um, and as I noted before, out of those marriages that are mixed orientation where the spouse comes out um, to his or her spouse after they're married, um, by three years out from that moment, 85% uh, of those marriages end in divorce. Now, the norm of encouraging gays and lesbians to stay in the closet um, or to pretend and act straight is inconsistent with integrity. It's just, it's, it's a violation of their authenticity, and, and a lot of them have to live duplicitous lives in order to um, sort of hack that lifestyle. So the norm tells people, this is a quote, um, again, this is the norm of opposite-sex marriage, tells gay people that it's acceptable to be gay as a matter of fact, but that it's unacceptable for gay people to act out that identity, to show same-sex affection, to discuss their sexuality in any significant way, to engage in behaviors that are perceived as gay. This denial of integrity, this severing of the self, can exact significant psychic damage on gay people and their relationships, and is ultimately stifling and harmful to society as a whole, particularly in a society in which we all, gay or straight, has some attribute that society pressures us to downplay in order to fit into the mainstream. Um, and so encouraging people, uh, homosexually oriented people, to act straight, to stay in the closet, um, to not express same-sex affections, um, has a harmful effect in that it breaches the integrity of those individuals when they comply with the norm. Um, there's a quote from another gay man. He said, I credit the atonement for the change that occurred in me. I obtained a new view of God and self. I could finally see myself with God, and that is how I know that my decision to live as a gay person was the right one. Because all those years of trying to change, trying to suppress it, trying to pluck it out of me, drove a wedge further and further between myself and God. He became so distant that I could no longer see how he could possibly exist. But the minute that I accepted my sexuality and decided that I would move forward doing the best I could as a gay man, living honestly with myself and others, God was in my life. He was all around me, and I was suddenly enabled to be a tool in his hands. Okay? So integrity could be um, increased, a net increase in t integrity from same-sex marriage. I'd also argue that security, meaning security in relationships, uh, security in a marriage, and the perceived physical, emotional, and psychological security, which often results from an intimate, committed, society-supported relationship. I'd argue that security is, there's a net gain there. Um, and that's a, a net gain that we as society should value. Homosexual couples are part of society. We need to value that net gain in security for them as well as integrity. Um, and I'd say that security is increased more by the presence than the absence of approved and, and legal same-sex marriage. Also, I would note that homosexuals are on average happier when same-sex marriage is available to them compared to when it is absent. And uh, my last reason is this community basis. Marriage connects a couple to their community in a way that cohabitation, uh, celibacy, and promiscuity do not. And I would say that there's value to that increased community connection. Um, to, so to summarize, same-sex marriage enables homosexual oriented people to live with greater integrity, greater security, um, greater happiness, and greater commitment and, ex and connection to the community. And I would note that this framework, these, these four attributes, um, are engendered, not guaranteed, um, by same-sex marriage, meaning there's enhanced capacity for them, not necessarily a guarantee that they will result in every case. But I would say that those net gains um, provide an inher inherent moral good um, that we should pursue compared to prohibiting same-sex marriage. Okay, So that's reason number 20, is that sort of virtue ethics perspective on uh, virtues being uh, net increased by same-sex marriage. Reason number 21 is entitled Homosexual Oriented People are children of God. So essentially this argument or this reason that supports LDS same-sex marriage, this moral argument, is an argument from equality. So we know as children of God we're all equal before him in his sight. He's no respecter of persons. So homosexual oriented people deserve the privileges and opportunities that are equally available to all of God's children. 
um, there is no separate but equal to God. That's the kind of idea that came from a famous uh, Supreme Court case, Plessy v. Ferguson, which recognized and upheld segregation. It was eventually overturned by a famous case, Brown v. Board of, um, Brown v. Board of Education, which declared that separate is inherently unequal. Um, I, say, I would say that we buy into the Nephi tradition, that it was strictly contrary to the commandments of God that there should be a law which should bring men on unequal grounds. That's from Alma 30, verse 7. Uh, similarly, King Mosiah wrote to his people, in this is, uh, chapter 29, verse 32, Now I desire that this inequality should no more be in this land, especially among my people, but I desire that this land should be a land of liberty, that every man may enjoy his rights and privileges alike, so long as the Lord sees fit that we may live and inherit the land, yea, even as long as any of our posterity remains upon the face of the land. Now, homosexual members of the church are in every way equal before God. They are candidates for exaltation. Even their tithing monies support chapels and temples in which they themselves are forbidden to marry a chosen spouse. Because homosexual people don't have equal access to heterosexual marriage, because um, for the most part they're counseled against it, as evidenced, for instance, by the Oaks Wickman Address of 2006, and because they are by nature generally ill-positioned for it compared to same-sex marriage, a logical deduction from equality is that an equal institution should be made available to them. That equal institution is LDS same-sex marriage. There's a Latin phrase that says, Ubi idem ratio ibi idem jus et de similibus idem est judicum. I apologize for my Latin pronunciation, but it means when there is the same reason, then the law is the same, and the same judgment should be rendered as to similar things. Okay, homosexual oriented people deserve and can benefit from marriage. It says heterosexually oriented people can. Uh, Same-sex marriage on average is more conducive for them than is opposite-sex marriage, and thus um, an argument from equality would say that they should have access to it if, in fact, you have opposite-sex couples having access to marriage. And a similar argument is made legally. The strongest argument for same-sex marriage is the reality that um, we grant opposite-sex marriage um, to opposite-sex couples. So that's argument 21. It's an argument from equality. Argument, uh, excuse me, reason. Reason number 22 is that there are many benefits for marriage to both individuals and society. Okay, so the literature says there's a lot of benefits of marriage compared to celibacy, compared to cohabitation, um, that are correlated with the actual act of getting and being married. Um, and now, I, I'm not sure that as many studies have been done on same-sex marriage, but I think it's a reasonable um, inference or deduction that some, if not all, of these benefits would apply to same-sex couples that are married compared to cohabiting and same-sex couples or uh, single homosexuals, as they do of opposite-sex married persons compared to um, single or celibate heterosexually oriented persons or um, cohabiting heterosexual opposite gender couples. So some of these um, benefits um, include longer life expectancies, uh, married people are more productive, they have higher incomes, they're more, they have more family time, they divide and specialized labor, and uh, they're more likely to volunteer, um, they're more likely to uh, avoid depression, they have fewer problems with alcohol, uh, men who are married and stay married are less depressed than those who remain single, um, the probability of moving out of a poor neighborhood is increased, um, and, and those are just uh, benefits that accrue to men and women. Benefits for men um, compared to women, men are less likely to have alcohol and drug addictions, to commit crime and to be abusive, uh, single men have six times the probability of being incarcerated as married men, the financial gains are substantial um, for married women compared to unmarried women. They have higher incomes, less likely to live in poverty. Um, they gain financially. They're 30% more likely to rate their health as excellent or good than single women of the same age. And I could go on and on. Um, these are all benefits that come from marriage as compared to um, being single or cohabiting. Um, in The Economist, there was a claim. It says, we have lived through a period in which 300,000 young Americans died of a terrible disease that was undoubtedly compounded by the total lack of any social incentives for stable relationships. Imagine what would happen to the STD rates or legitimacy rates if heterosexual marriage were somehow not in existence. It gives one cause for pause there. To finish the quote, do you think that straight men would be more or less socially responsible without the institution of civil marriage? Okay, so that was an argument from The Economist um, for marriage. Um, and Jonathan Rausch has extended this argument to same-sex marriage in the context of the AIDS crisis. Uh, he says, the culture of marriage might not have stopped the virus altogether, but it certainly would have slowed down the virus and saved who knows how many lives and who knows how much money in agony. 
A sexual under underworld is inevitable in every society, but in a marriageless society, its extent is greater and its allure stronger. And of course, the cost is higher. Syphilis, gonorrhea, and all the rest have haunted sexual underworlds since long before AIDS appeared. But beyond disease, there's also a moral cost. In the context of heterosexual life, conservatives take for granted that a culture in which marriage is the norm is a healthier culture for children. It has always struck me as peculiar that so many conservatives have denounced the homosexual lifestyle, usually meaning to a large extent the gay sexual underworld, while fighting tooth and nail against letting gays participate in the institution which would do the most to change that lifestyle. And I would, I would agree with that irony. And so one of the strongest arguments I would say for same-sex marriage is the benefits that occur to homosexual oriented people and society that come from marriage as opposed to promiscuity, cohabitation, or celibacy. Okay, so reason number 23 is that there are a lot of benefits from marital homosexual conduct itself. Okay, so again, we're talking about reasons that support a moral case for LDS same-sex marriage. We've talked about 20 reasons so far. Uh, we're up now on reason 23. So in addition to the benefits that we just talked about, um, the actual sexual conduct between committed same-sex partners may be morally beneficial in the same ways as marital heterosexual conduct between opposite sex partners. Uh, I'm going to address both sides of why this should be so, both in avoiding harm and in causing benefits okay, by promoting human love. So first let's talk about avoiding human harm. Um, there's a lot of potential for harm that comes from restricting opportunities for sex and romance because they're natural parts of being human. Um, Elder Oaks counseled to the person, the homosexual, who cannot control his or her homosexual feelings. He counseled them not to enter into heterosexual marriage. Um, and this amounts to a prohibition against sex, if not also uh, necking, kissing, flirting, and other romantic and sexual gestures between two persons of the same sex that are attracted to each other. Um, you see this evidence in the BYU's Honor Code that uh, there's a, a different sexual standard for um, homosexual conduct compared to heterosexual conduct. Um, despite the fact that a number of uh, church leaders have indicated that it, we have one standard of sexual conduct that applies across the board. There's a double standard at BYU, um, and you see a double standard in Other Oaks Council as well. And you see that, on average, homosexual oriented people are prohibited from um, engaging in necking, kissing, flirting, and romantic um, expressions that they would desire to participate in. Um, and I would say also that this counsel from Elder Oaks removes reasonable hope of sexual and romantic expression for homosexuals in this life. Um, because uh, for many homosexual oriented people, having uh, sexual and romantic fulfillment with an opposite gender person is not feasible for them. And I find it difficult um, for me personally, even though my experience won't match that of everyone, to uh, embrace celibacy or to advise, advise someone else to embrace celibacy, which is something that I would probably be unwilling to do myself. I'm, I'm single, I'm 27, over the last 10 years I would say the most persistent psychological stress, the most in, intense distress that I've uh, experienced has been from repressing my own sexual and romantic impulses. Uh, I'm committed to abstinence from premarital sex and other sexual indulgences until marriage, and, and the clash between this commitment and my uninvited, often nigh-consuming libido has caused me intense pain and discomfort. Um, and yes, certainly uh, choosing um, to have romantic and or sexual expression is, is a choice, right? But you can also choose whether to eat, to sleep, to breathe, to defecate. But when you choose to refrain from these activities, you don't get to choose the consequences, and oftentimes they're quite severe. When you, when you refrain from sleeping, eating, defecating, um, or breathing, some pretty bad things happen. Um, Long-term repression of romantic and sex drives is counter to fundamental human biology and human happiness. And unsurprisingly, it leads to elevated rates of anxiety, depression, uh, frustration, and, and apathy for homosexual-oriented people. And that's just a short list of the outcomes. Um, and you see similar outcomes from a lack of human touch. We live in a culture that's very anti-homo-tactile. Uh, it's kind of keep gays away from children. Um, it's kind of a ho it's a very homophobic culture, and and for instance, it's it's more normal for women to touch each other, I would say mercifully, because there's such an, an immense benefits that come from human touch, and I would say also from um, human romantic and sexual expression, and so it's difficult for me to advise a lifetime of abstinence from sexual and romantic expression for homosexuals when I wouldn't be willing to follow that counsel myself if it were given to me. Um, I mean, applying the golden rule of, of doing to others as you would have done unto you if an authoritarian regime told me to stop dating, 
to stop kissing, to stop uh, pursuing a legitimate sexual relationship for the rest of my life. I, I can imagine myself rebelling against that authority and probably saying a few colorful things on my way out the door. Um, I think that it's reasonable to consider the indirect consequences as well. Like, Not only are the homosexual oriented people likely going to suffer from sexual romantic repression and from the lack of emotional intimacy and stability, um, but there's going to be a lot of other people interacting with them that will suffer from their apathy and from their depression and from those effects that come from their repression. Okay, so that's one side of the coin. Again, reason 23 is that there are benefits from the um, sexual and romantic expression in a same-sex marriage. Um, not having those expressions leads to harms. Having those expressions leads to benefits. Let me um, illustrate some of them. Uh, I'd illustrate them, and again this is about the area of promoting human love, uh, by asking a question. Is sexual conduct morally praiseworthy or worthy of condemnation? Is sexual conduct morally praiseworthy or worthy of condemnation? Uh, now I'd propose that the answer is, it depends. It runs the whole gamut, the spectrum from reprehensible on the one end of the spectrum to exalting on the other. Now the relevant factors to answer that question of sexual conduct being morally praiseworthy or condemning um, rests on two factors. One um, is the context of the sexual conduct. Is it in, a, sex, is it in a, a marital committed relationship or is it not? If it's premarital or extramarital, then the uncommitted sex is less moral. If it's in a committed marital relationship, then the sexual conduct is more moral. Okay, that's not the end of the inquiry or the answer, but it is uh, part of it. Um, and we know there's a quote that says, The Lord's law of moral conduct is abstinence from sexual relations outside of lawful marriage and fidelity within marriage. Sexual relations are proper only between husband and wife expressed within the bonds of marriage. Um, and I would assert that sex within same-sex marriage can fulfill the same purpose. Um, there's an author named Michael Sandel who was summarizing um, a federal court's analysis and said the following. The marital relationship is significant, wrote the Courts of Appeal, not only because of its procreative purpose, but also because of its unsurpassed opportunity for mutual support and self-expression that it provides. It recalled the Supreme Court's observation in Griswold v. Connecticut that marriage is a coming together for better or for worse, hopefully enduring and intimate to the degree of being sacred. And it went on to suggest that the qualities the Court so prized in Griswold could be present in homosexual unions as well. It ended with this quote, For some... The sexual activity in question here serves the same purpose as the intimacy of marriage. And I would think this would be a pretty uh, intuitive conclusion as to the benefit of um, sexual conduct within a committed um, same-sex marital relationship. Now, in addition to the context, again, this is answering the question of is sexual conduct morally good or morally bad, um, we also need to look at the motive of the individual. And uh, this matters a lot to whether the conduct is morally um, praiseworthy or worthy of condemnation. Um, here's a couple examples that point this out. Uh, we can imagine two individuals that are engaging in uh, sexual conduct. We can imagine, um, and I'll read this as a quote, the wife who withholds sex with a view to negotiating a fur coat is acting immorally. She is behaving like a prostitute, even if a legal prostitute. And the husband who uses his wife as a convenient instrument of masturbation Seeking exclusively, exclusively his own egotistical pleasure is immoral and remains so even if the act is open to the possibility of procreation. From these examples, it should be obvious that there is something more to the moral quality of sexual behavior than merely the purely objective legal question of marriage or even the objective, objective rational question of openness to procreation. Okay, so the intentions and motives of the individual engaging the contact is very relevant. Um, now, oftentimes in thinking about same-sex conduct, obviously just I'm, I'm a straight person to most straight people. It, it seems repugnant to uh, first um, imagine or picture same-sex uh, sexual relationships. Um, but there's some reasons why perhaps we shouldn't let that initial uh, repugnance govern our moral conclusions. Um, let's, uh, I'm going to read a quote that says, The mutual inward molding of husband and wife, this determined effort to perfect each other, can in a very real sense, as the Roman Catechism teaches, be said to be the chief reason and purpose of matrimony, provided that matrimony be looked at not in the restricted sense, as instituted for the proper conception and education, but more widely as the blending of life as a whole and the mutual interchange and sharing thereof. Again, this is harkening back to that we over a me identity that's essential to the substance of family and, and marriage. Um, and oftentimes we, we take a look at that sexual behavior and, and, you know, we're kind of put off by it. 
Um, there's a quote on addressing this sort of this tension and response. He says, We do not find it contrary to nature that man has taken the hands which biological evolution provided him as a grasping instrument and employed them in the ideal creative pursuits of wielding a brush or a pen. Nor do we find it contrary to nature that man has used his mouth with its teeth, tongue, and lips, obviously intended by nature for eating, in order to communicate through speech and song his most intimate aspirations. Nor should we find it any less, according to nature, for procreation, in order to give the most intimate expression to his drive for union and love with his fellow man. Okay, and if we do really take to its conclusion that naturalist argument about um, sexual conduct, that it's only approved morally between a man and a woman because of the nature of the biology, we take out all the abilities for a compute, like having the dimensional component of human love, of interpersonal love in that expression. It's just a mere, it's just a biological act. Um, and, and hopefully it's more than that. Here's a quote. It says, It is this personal uniqueness of indi every individual which forms the necessary basis for the possibility of human love. A loving action, even if it takes the form of a sexual gesture, must be directed to other as unique, as an end in himself or herself. To treat another person merely as a means to an end that lies outside the person himself represents a failure to love that person as unique. And from this personalist viewpoint, an overemphasis on procreation can be seen as leading potentially to seriously immoral and dehumanizing form of sexuality. Modern consciousness has been sensitized by the movement for women's rights to the fact that to understand the female exclusively in a functional manner as a bearer of children is depersonalizing and therefore an immoral attitude. Such an emphasis can be seen as in conflict with the gospel emphasis on the respect and love due to one's fellow human as a person. As we have seen, a general consideration of scriptural data concerning sexual behavior leads to only one certain conclusion, that sexual relationships can be um, justified morally only when they are a true expression of human love. The call of the gospel to man is not one of conforming passively to biological givens, rather that, rather that call is to transform and humanize the natural order through the power to love. Okay, um, and again, the, the wife withholding sex with a view to getting the fur coat is immoral, as is the man who uses his wife only as a, instrument of, um, a convenient instrument of masturbation. So the motive of the individual as well as the context is what governs our answer to the question of is sexual conduct moral or immoral. So to conclude this reason, the increase of human love as can be expressed through human sexual, excuse me, through sexual conduct in a committed homo homosexual partnerships stands as another significant benefit of same-sex marriage and another reason to support LDS same-sex marriage. So this concludes reason 23. In the next clip, um, we'll conclude with reasons 24, 25, and 26.